yeah, good morning. Welcome back to Microscopy Live. Um, as you all join in, we're really glad that you're all here. Um, this is a very exciting one for us. Um, we're part of the Winchcombe Science Team. So Winchcombe being the meteorite that landed in the UK last year. First meteorite to be recovered in the UK for 30 years. Um, and we're very glad that we've got a little piece of it. And we're helping in the scientific effort to get it characterised. So I'm Jen. I'm at the front. I've got Lorelei in the middle. And our special guest, uh, Natasha, at the end. So not only is Nat our facility director, she's also a planetary geologist. Um, so she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> um, so today we're back on our Joel 7001. Joel are very kindly sponsoring us. Um, so they're going to help us bring microscopy life to more people um, and supporting us in our endless endeavors uh, to show you all how electron microscopy works. So I'm going to pass over to Lorelei. She's going to introduce you to our favorite microscope. Yeah. Uh, this is the one that we both learned on um God, eight yeah. years ago now in my case <laughs> uh, three or four in yeah. mine. <laughs> so a while ago so yeah um today we are using our joel 7001 which is our field emission microscope which just means it can get a much higher resolution and we can look at things in much higher detail than we could in a tungsten microscope so if i start at the top so at the top here we have that is the emission so that's where our electron beams come from and then this column is where I go down. There's magnets in there that align the beam and make it super precise. And then this here is the sample chamber. So this is where our sample is in today. And then that's this is just our exchange port where we can get samples in and out of. And then there are various detectors around that we will explain how they work and what, what we use them for as we go along. Yeah. Um, yeah. So kind of. Um, General microscopy live rules. Um, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat or you can unmute and ask us. We will do our best to answer every single question that we get. Um, other than that, no. I think we're kind of okay Three, to get yeah. going. Yeah. So I'm going to share the screen. So if you came along to our very, uh, we did a very sort of similar thing where we can show you the software that we use to collect all our data from. Uh, we've also got a super sneaky pre-prepared image of the whole sample. So you guys will get to choose where you want to look at and what you want to look at. And we'll make sure that we show you everything that you think is interesting. And we'll do our best to explain it. <laughs> um, so feel free to start having think about what you'd like us to look at first and we'll get going. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we can tell you that Winchcombe is a CM2 chondrite. That means it forms in the outer solar system. So it's kind of more like mud than lava. Um, but it's made up of very similar minerals. So we have lots of olivine, which is the same mineral that you get in lavas and in Earth's mantle. Um, let me enable that one. There yeah. we go. Um, but it's also really important because these meteorites contain some of the oldest solids ever, pretty much, in our solar system. Um, so the oldest CAI, it's a calcium aluminium rich inclusion, is 4.65. Eight seven billion years old, um, which is a lot. <laughs> it's really really old. These are some of the first um, folds of form, and we're really lucky that they get preserved in these sorts of meteorites. Lots of different types. Um, yeah, if you if there's any particular features on this one that you'd like to have a look at, put it in the chat. Let us know where we'd like to start. If not, we will find something fun. I mean, all of it's fun. All of it is fun. We are like very biased <laughs> as geologists. <laughs> Shall we start with a bit of information about it being a one-year anniversary of Winchcombe? Ah, it is. Um, so, God, it was one year, so two days ago? On Monday. Monday. 28th. Um, it was exactly one, exactly one year. Um, so we've measured time this one pretty well. Yeah. Um, so very fortunate for us, and that actually got to go into the field to collect um, bits of Winchcombe. Yeah. So the Winchcombe fireball was actually seen across the country by hundreds and hundreds of people and it was spotted as far away as uh, the north of France, Northern Ireland, Scotland as well. Um, as scientists, we actually only have this meteorite because it was due to members of the public who had seen it and had reported it to the UK Fireball Alliance and a very, very uh, generous family whose driveway it landed on let us know straight away that it was there. They recovered it perfectly, didn't touch it with bare hands. And uh, the Wilcox family uh, were really, really great, and they actually donated it all to the Natural History Museum so it could be used scientifically. Um, and we sent around the country to lots of different science teams. There's also a little piece still in the Winchcombe Museum, um, which gets used for a lot of education and outreach in the local area. So this isn't uh, just a scientific discovery. This has really belonged to the whole UK community who helped recover that. So hundreds and hundreds of people coming together, 
reporting sightings, doing modeling, and those of us that went out and looked for it. So it really couldn't happen without the whole of the UK coming together. So thank you very much to everybody if you were part of that initial spotting and recovery team. The first question there is from Damian. Um, does anything make it different or distinct from other CM2 carbonaceous chondrites? I think it's important because we do have orbital data for this, so we know where it's come from, and that's all being released in science papers later this year. Um, it's a breccia, which means it's made up of lots of different types of CM2 material, and we're very lucky on our piece that you can see kind of this line through here is actually two different types of rocks stuck next to each other. So that's very exciting. We've got more rock per rock, so it's a very, <laughs> very good value meteorite in yeah, this case. Rock squared. Yeah. Um, did you want to pick your favourite bit, Matt? And we'll zoom in and we'll start there. Uh, yes. Yeah, why not? That's very easy. <laughs> I, am a, yeah. I study metal and stuff, so... So what's happening today is we've got Nat driving the microscope. Um, when she's found something that she likes and she's got everything in focus, we will pull it across into this software. This lets us not only copy across the images, but we can also do compositional data. So we can tell you exactly what different minerals are made out of um, in terms of an elemental composition. So now we've got an image on the microscope. We can scan it across over here, and you'll see it load in. So, to explain backscatter electron imaging. Backscatter electron imaging. OK, let's, let's do this. I should know. <laughs> we did this earlier this yeah. week. OK, so backscatter works by um, showing you mainly the kind of the chemical densities of um, the sample. So you start off with the electron beam, which shoots down onto the surface, zaps it, and then it sometimes knocks electrons out of the shells. And then they come out. That's slightly different, isn't it? Slightly wrong. Anyway, no. yeah, no, that is right. Yeah, they release energy. <laughs> yeah, they release energy. Yeah. And basically, um, the heavier the elements that it's found, the more energy is released. So the brighter you, it comes up on the screen. So when you've got elements like iron or gold or metals or things that are heavier down the periodic table, they come up as really, really bright white and lighter grays. Whereas if you've got lighter elements like oxygen or silica or um, carbon, then they come up as a lot darker and show up as darker gray. Yeah. So if you've got a, a sample that's quite heterogeneous like this is, so it's got lots of different chemical compositions in it, it comes up as a very pretty, varied grayscale map yeah. that we have here. Yeah. Yeah, so we can give you a good example of how the backscatter works in terms of elements. So like Laurel, I said, heavy elements, sharp as white. So I will create a spectra right in the middle of this white splodge. And light elements, sharp as dark. So I'll put one over here as well. And we'll show you the difference in composition between them. So this little software is great. It just has a little flow chart across the top that we follow along. No. <laughs> OK. Go away. <laughs> we'll just put that one over there. Um, so what we can do is with these two spectra, so this is recording which elements are present where. Um, so we can see we've got this big iron peak in that light mineral, so that's really heavy. And we see we've got lots of iron in it. We've got 71% iron, 22% oxygen, and a little bit of nickel. That's pretty common for meteoritic metals. There's often a bit of nickel involved. If we compare that to that darker mineral, um, we can see there's, there's no iron in it really at all. Um, instead, we've got lots of magnesium, silica, and oxygen. So this is a mineral called olivine. Um, this is the same sort of stuff you get in Earth's mantle. It's one of the earliest silicate minerals to form. Um, it forms pretty high temperatures. It takes quite a lot of heat, really, to melt olivine. It's very pretty. It's, it's, quite... it's a nice one. It's nice and yeah. green. <laughs> nice and green yeah. to do some kind of greenish brown, depending yeah. on the kind. Yeah. So if there's anything else in this particular image that anyone would like to us to zap, let us know, or if you're feeling really brave, we can actually give control over to one of you um, and you can collect your own data using the software. Um, we have a question. Yeah. Any AOA, so AOAs are amorphous olivine aggregates. Very technical. I think. Yeah, I have no idea. In my defense, I do igneous meteorites. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I don't do meteorites at all, yeah. so I'm. Winch can have been a learning curve for all of us. <laughs> Um, there are some amorphous olivine aggregates in Winchcombe. Um, as we drive around the sample, we'd like to see some. If you see one that's particularly interesting, let us know, give us a shout, and we'll make sure that we zoom in on it and give yeah. you like a proper view. And then there's another one. Yeah. 
how has the materials changed coming through Earth's atmosphere? So meteorites can lose anywhere up to 90% um, of their mass as they come through the atmosphere. It's actually very hard to throw a rock through an atmosphere, it turns out. Um, we're quite lucky, but not a whole lot changes during that process. Um, and because winching was recovered so quickly, it didn't get rained on, which is nice. That really helps. Um, it turns out if you have a meteorite that's full of metal and it lands in a wet field, it will rust immediately. Um, so I've done a couple of meteorite hunts out in South Australia. So we'll pick up a nice meteorite, really pretty, really fresh. Um, and we'll take it back to Melbourne, which isn't that far away, but the humidity there is enough that it immediately rusts the meteorites. Um, so we're actually very lucky that Winchcombe was recovered so fast, which means it's actually a very pristine sample. In the, in the case of Winchcombe, because it's a carbonaceous chondrite, these meteorites don't tend to rust. They actually break down to clay minerals and they start to just physically fall apart into what looks more like a muddy substance rather than rusting. So for Winchcombe, the material that was recovered within 12 hours all came from one place. And that's largely a material that we're looking at um, in scientific collections. There was also another piece that was found a few miles away in a field, and that was recovered just a few days later. And then everything that was subsequently recovered, so a lot of the Winchkin material that's in um, sort of private collections and meteorite dealers passing on, that material has been rained on. So it is a little bit different to what we're seeing in the pristine samples today, which can, uh, can have a really big impact on the carbonaceous chondrites in general, and particularly in this type of CM2 as well. Yeah, no, that's it. Why is it so round like the top of a nice cream tub? Because space doesn't really have gravity, um, when you have a melt, so you can almost think of it like a drop of water, the surface tension of that will pull itself into the sphere. And that's likely what's happened with this little metal droplet here. Um, you'll see in other meteorites that have really well-defined chondrules, they're also round. Um, and it's just because of the surface tension of that particular material when it was liquid pulls it into a nice little sphere shape, uh, which is quite fun. So chondrites are more like sandstones than they are any other sort of terrestrial rock. And they kind of form through the same processes, sort of stick together through the same sort of things. Um, so it's like, let's remember that this isn't a meteorite Q&A, it's microscopy live. So we yep. want to showcase the types of microscopy that we can do here in the center. Somewhere else. Because oh, that one's in the matrix pathology, it actually makes really ugly maps. <laughs> Have you found the little spinel? Oh, it's that sort of darkish blob on the right hand side. That one, I think, yeah. If I remember my way around this rock. <laughs> hey, I do! <laughs> yeah. um, does this slide contain any fusion crusts? Um, no, not for us, unfortunately. Um, other people um, who are working on this have managed to get bits of fusion crust. Imperial. Yep, um, but not for us, unfortunately. Um, so let's pull across a new image. So this is kind of um, what carbonaceous chondrites look like, pretty much. Um, so the important thing about carbonaceous chondrites is they've undergone aqueous alteration. So rather than just being heated up, they've also got wet, uh, <laughs> which means you end up with like these sort of very fine grain sort of little bits, um, which are super fine actually. We could do another site and zoom right in and like, because yeah. what this is 250 times magnification. That's nothing. <laughs> The benefit of using yeah. electrons is we can look very close up and very yeah, high once resolution. Yeah, the new image is brought up, we'll explain the scale and just yeah. how tiny some of this stuff is. Yes. So what Nat's doing now, she's zoomed in, so she's refocusing. Um, so every time we change magnification, we like to refocus. And as we move across the sample, it's a good idea to refocus. Um, so although we polish our samples flat, they may not be completely flat. There may be a bit of an angle on them, or when we mount them, they may be at a slight angle. Um, because we're dealing with an electron beam rather than light, having everything in focus is really, really important, especially when it comes to detectors that are reconstructing all the energy being released by the sample into meaningful data for us. Um, especially when you're dealing with super, super tiny things. Um, if you want nice images, they need to be in focus, much like taking photos with a camera. Yep. So it's largely the same principle, actually. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay, just so we can get a sense of scale once this image is loaded, mm -hmm. do you want to 
So there is a scale bar at the bottom of the screen, which is showing 25 microns or micrometers, mm -hmm. which in reference, uh, one micrometer, there's how many? There's a thousand micrometers in a millimeter. In a millimeter. So that's 0 0.002. So very, very tiny. Hmm. And within that, we can then also see even tinier things. So this little white splodge up here, if we measure that, is 2.6 microns. So absolutely tiny. And yeah. this is only a thousand times the magnification. So that's still pretty everyday sort of easy stuff for our microscopes to handle. Yeah, let's, let's go even, even higher. Let's see what we can get. You can see kind of like all the sort of like messy sort of fluffy texture. That's all that aqueous alteration. Um, so it was this water and other liquids that were on this asteroid um, before Winchcom got liberated from it that sort of degraded all these silicates and basically made clay. So inner solar system meteorites are very, very dry. They're just made out of rocks and sort of silicate minerals. Um, as you go into the outer solar system past the snow line, that's where you start getting water and all the other stuff. So it, we're very pleased actually that Winchcom is an interesting meteorite. Um, if it had landed, the first meteorite for 30 years landed and was just the most ordinary, uneventful meteorite, it would have been a little bit disappointing. Um, but this one is actually a very, very interesting little rock. So now we're at 10 microns. Um, so that whole scale bar at the bottom there is now 10 microns, even closer. And you can start getting a good idea of like what this texture in the middle looks like. Um, that's the same white splodge we measured earlier. And that's going to go in even further um, to give you an idea of scale. We're just going to get it refocused. So we're now at 12,000 highest magnification. Uh, so if we start this one, even more zoomed in. So we're in that sort of fuzzy texture, so that altered material. Because we've actually got all these super, super fine little crystals. I think this is so TCI, so it's Sopilonite crustendite. I think it's crustendite. Which um, are? They, so that's a very good question. <laughs> um, so TCI is basically clumps of minerals that are sort of ubiquitous in carbonaceous chondrites. In our case, we have them in their drusy form. So drusy just means they form sort of like fluffy little like feathery needly sort of shapes. They're not big clumps of like proper sort of like traditional crystal shapes. Um, but these are everywhere throughout Winchcombe. Um, are those larger, bit larger crystals olivine? Yeah. Um, so if we pop back to let's see this chat, if we go back to the previous slide, these big flat dark grey clumps um, and in this guy, so like these big sort of like very flat looking dark grey minerals, those are olivine. Um, so not only do we have chondrules, we also have mineral fragments in this meteorite. So we've actually got a lot going on. Yeah, yeah, we could do that. How do you prepare polish this kind of material for SEM if it's mostly clay or water soluble minerals? Okay, so I'm gonna have to take a wild, not wild guess, but an educated <laughs> guess at this because I didn't sort of prep this sample myself. Somebody at Natural History Museum did. So normally when you um, want to prepare a sample for SEM, especially for rocks, because you want a flat surface, we normally cut it down to a right size because you can't just shove a rock in a microscope because that's normally a little bit too big for the chamber. So it gets cut down, there's a flat surface, and then we normally embed it in resin. So we put it in a cup, like a circular thing, and then pour resin over it and put it in a vacuum oven just because rocks tend to have a lot of air holes and pores. And because um, SEMs work at vacuum, air causes issues. So we want to get as much of those air bubbles out as possible, just so it makes it easier for us to get it all pumped down to vacuum. So we do that and then it gets polished. So you go through, basically it's just like using sandpaper and going down grit by grit, getting finer and finer until you've got a, a scratch free surface. Normally this is done with water, but in the case of most things, when it, if they are, you're working with water soluble materials, you can do this with alcohol or oil just because that then you're not using water. So I don't know if this was done with water. 
it was done with oil. So yeah, this was done with oil. Um, so what we're doing at the moment is we've zoomed in on one of those olivine fragments. So that's this little chunk in the middle. What we're doing now is we're doing element mapping. So not only can we tell you in exactly wherever you click what composition it is, we can also do it over a whole area. So it's now collecting compositional data for across this entire area. So it's going to keep running through um, and it will basically sort of produce these nice images of how these elements are distributed, um, which are now nicely color coded. Um, so it pops up all the elements that it can see on there. So this is the software deciding which elements are present. And I would agree that those are all the ones that are present. Um, let's put calcium in like a dark blue, why not? <gasps> Going against the colour scheme. Oh, but the rest of the colours are quite nice. Okay, <laughs> that, that's, that makes sense. So, we have a question. Mm. Like F Story Bunu, where they named different areas to characterise the surface, with this little mini rock, have you given names to the different areas, i.e. are they named after people? Fortunately not. Oh, no. <laughs> We've numbered all the different mythologies. So we yeah. only have two different mythologies in our sample that we have here in Plymouth, but some of the other samples that are spread around the country have got multiple mythologies that are different to ours. So they're numbered at the moment, and we're all coming together to work out who are similar ones. And we think we've got at least seven different mythologies mm -hmm. within this meteorite. And given the mass we have is only about 550 grams, that's quite a distinct number of different types of rock in mm -hmm. one sample. I uh, would love to see an element map of the CAI. Um, unfortunately, in our piece of Winchcombe, most of them have been altered out. Um, we do have some refractory um, features. So these are kind of like the first solids. We have a little bit of spinel, um, which is having done maps of previously is remarkably uneventful. It is very consistent in composition. <laughs> um, but if I just pop back briefly to the backscatter image, um, some of the other teams who also have bits of Winchcombe have features like this sort of splodge up here. There's a slight enrichment in aluminium in some of these, and they think that might be the um, an altered CAI. Um, fortunately for us, Winchcombe just got a little bit too wet to preserve a lot of them, and we've got a super, super tiny piece as well. Um, yeah. But I think there are definitely other teams that have more sort of traditional looking CAIs. But as and when those papers are released, they will be made available. Um, you should take a picture of the actual sample for scale, because this piece is mm. tiny, like it's less than a centimetre across. Oh, it's way less. It's way less. It's so small. It's... No, I don't think so. I know I copied across the ones that don't have scale bars because ah. I'm not very organised. It turns out. Um, but now we can see we've had this map run through a couple of times, and those colours are getting like quite defined now. So I'll let it. Oh, stop that on. So I'll stop it after this time. So what we can do with this data is we can export all of these individual maps, and we can combine them. Um, to produce useful colour schemes. So we can combine them to show different silicate phases, we can look at accessory phases, um, but we can also reconstruct all spectral data from this as well. So it's actually very useful. So we can see we've got this big sort of like olivine chunk in the middle. I say big, it's <laughs> this 12 micron olivine chunk in the middle. Um, and we've also got this sort of like more sort of orangey, so the sulfur bearing stuff around the edge. That's an alteration product, that's tequilonite. We've also got like this aluminium rich and calcium rich log through here, which is more like uh, a mineral called apatite. Um, basically, mapping itself is very quick, it's incredibly useful. Um, but I think we should probably go have a look at that big zoned olivine, because that'll make a nice map. Yeah, basically. So, one of the features we have in Winchcombe, one of our favourite features, because we're all igneous geologists. <laughs> It's this really nice big chunk of olivine that has compositional zoning. Um, so the way that compositional zoning works um, in these rocks is that once, basically, as the crystal develops and grows, the melt it's forming from changes in composition, different elements get sucked up into different stages of, of sort of crystal development. Um, and we're very lucky that we've just got a very nice example of it in this meteor. Yeah. Shall shall pull across. And also, if we start saying things and you get confused or don't understand what we're talking please about, tell please tell us, because we will quite happily explain things more if you start getting confused. Yeah. Sometimes, especially when we get excited, we start getting a little bit too technical, because we, we, we do know quite a lot about this stuff. Yeah. So this is our big flat olivine crystal um, in the centre. And if I jiggle the brightness contrast around, I might be able to pull out. Yeah, there you can go. kind of see it. Though. Yeah. You see, it's like it's a little bit darker in the center and it's a little bit lighter around the edge. We've also got this um, high density phase showing the white in the backscatter and it's in the sort of like standard sort of 
winch for me, muddy mess around everything else. But we'll start off with, uh, let's do some point ID. So we'll put a point in the middle of that dark bit, and we'll put a point in that lighter bit so we can, and if I it on, pull up the spectra, we can see how those numbers change. So this one's got about 20% iron, um, magnesium, about 20% iron in it. Whereas at the outer edge, we've got much more iron and much less magnesium. Um, so we've got a nice little zoning. Um, I can't remember what this white stuff is made out of, so I'm going to put a point in there. I iron. think it's a sulfur? Iron nickel. Iron nickel sulfur. So. I don't. Yeah, pendendite. I was going to say pendendite is the only mineral I know yeah. that's. It's a, that, that's also on earth, that is a, um, mm. um, what you try to look for when you're trying to mine nickel. Yeah. Uh, so, would that indicate multiple heating vents or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Um, carbonaceous chondrites never got particularly hot. Um, instead, they all went through sort of aqueous water based alteration. Um, so, if you compare it to igneous meteorites, like you might get from Mars or from the Moon, they record really, really complex thermal histories, but Winchcombe doesn't seem to have that at the moment. So, we're going to make a nice colour scheme out of this. So, we're doing another element map because this will show up really nicely that zoning from the magnesium rich core to that iron rich rim around the edge. And having mapped this little bit a couple of times myself, it does look pretty. If I can remember what colours I used to have it in. I think magnesium used to be pink. Oh, no, it wasn't. No. It was not pink. <laughs> Um, I'll turn sulfur on as well, because that'll be nice. Colours! Oh, okay. uh, iron is green. I can make it greener. Let's see magnesium was red. No. So part of um, using the mapping function is that everyone very quickly develops color schemes that they like and work for their particular sort of rocks. So whenever someone else is driving a microscope and chooses colors, it can get very sort of like quite confusing. If you're so used to seeing an element in a certain color, suddenly seeing something else in that color, it takes a little bit of time for your brain to get wrapped around it. What else do we have in here? I'll put nickel in red because that'll make it stand out. We have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you see similar olivine zonation in palisites or ordinary chondrites? Yeah. 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 Um, so this sort of zoning is really, really common across meteorites, but also in terrestrial rocks. Um, so geology works the same on Earth as it does in space. Um, it's pretty nice and consistent. Uh, no matter where rocks are, if they're forming out from a melt, they work the same way, which is pretty relaxing, actually. It makes my life much easier. So now I'm adding in different colours, um, basically to show up different features. I probably don't need sodium on. Sodium's everywhere. Um, but in these little individual other maps, you can start seeing lots of features happening. So we've got that bright magnesium rich cord, and it dims out a little bit around the edge. But we've also got this little peak of chrome, and that's this little splodge over here. So mapping like this can actually be quite useful for pulling out different features that you might not see. They might be the same color in the backscatter image, that grayscale. Once you put the element maps over the top, it actually you can find a lot of new things in it, which is quite nice. I might let that one run through. I'll see that that one run. Shall we put the large area map back up? Yes. There you go. I'll zoom in a little bit on this guy. Yeah, there's. So there's lots of stuff to look at in here. So if you do see anything interesting as we pan across, let us know and we will go find it for you. We've got army trite and microscope in the same orientation as this map, so everything will look the same to you today. So we are up here at the moment. Uh, we're in this big zone crystal. So I shall scroll across pop it in the chat or just shout at us if there's anything interesting that you would like to see and we will go find it. So remember, so your high density minerals, so your heavy elements are showing up as white, your low density stuff is showing up as dark greys. Spotty thing off to the left. Is that, that spotty thing? That one to the right. Oh, that's the right. Or that, this or that one. They're, they're the same, they similar. are the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, we can absolutely go find some of those. What's the prettiest one? 
I don't think I actually looked at either of those before myself. We'll stop that map and we'll make a new site. So to share the that map off on my list. Yes. So now we've got our big element map. So I'll show you here. So you can kind of start picking up different minerals based on what colours they are. So you can once you've got your element maps, you can match up um, areas of the same composition because they'll all be the same colour. So all these sort of little yellow splodges, these are all the same composition. Um, we've also got this little sort of browny orange peak here. Um, my colour schemes always end up looking very 70s. Um, no matter what I do, that's just how they turn out. I think all of them do end up, you don't yeah. use bright colours to pick things out yeah. anyway. Um, yep, so we've got this little bit here, that's probably a mineral called pyroxene. That's the second thing to crystallise after olivine in a typical igneous sequence. So it's not uncommon to find olivine and pyroxene next to each other. Um, everything's fun. Yeah, so if we compare the sulfur and the nickel maps, so we know all of the same composition, it's the same colour, but also it's showing up in the same places. Um, we also know that sulfur and nickel, that they don't overlap. So some minerals or some elements have very similar spectra, um, and then we use our knowledge to tell the software what is there or what isn't there. So sulfur and molybdenum overlap, um, so sometimes the software can get a little bit confused and we just tell it which one it should be. We can double check ourselves um, and we can sort of like teach it kind of what to expect. So let's go have a look at this spotty thing. Any visual difference between two lithologies you mentioned? Uh, there is. Um, so this lithology that we're in at the moment is what most of our meteorite is made up from. Um, and it's kind of like this sort of typical sort of like fuzzy, muddy sort of texture. The other lithology we have at the bottom is made more out of mineral fragments. Um, so there's less chondrules, there's less sulfides. Um, so there are definite compositional and textual differences, which we are slowly piecing together with the rest of the research teams. So we'll let the map start on this little splodgy thing. So again, we've got this nice sort of like high density phase. We've got this low density stuff surrounded by that sort of typical Winchcombe matrix. With these samples from Hayabusa and Bennu, will you get a chance to sample those in the years to come and compare your findings on this? We will. So there are lots of teams that are working on the Hayabusa 2 samples that have come back already. So the first ones landed in the UK the week before last, including at the Natural History Museum with uh, Dr. Ashley King, who is the uh, PI, the principal investigator on the Winchcombe science, who's coordinating that with a colleague, Martin Suttle, at the Open University. So they are working on the Hayabusa 2 samples already. With regards to the original Hayabusa sample, we do actually have one mm -hmm. from uh, asteroid Itakawa, which is not similar to Bennu and Ruguru, which are the asteroids. So Hayabusa 2 is the mission. And Ruku is the uh, is the asteroid. The new is the asteroid that Osiris Rex as a mission has gone to, um, and they are both sampling what we think are likely to be carbonaceous chondrite like parent bodies. Whereas the Hayabusa mission, which you've mentioned, actually went to Itakawa, which is more like an LL chondrite, so a low iron, low metal chondrite meteorite parent body. So we do have Hayabusa samples in the lab, and we've been comparing them to our LL chondrites in our meteorite collection as well. So looking at this little splodgy bit, let's turn sodium off because the sodium is everywhere. <laughs> um, we've actually got very similar composition. So we've got this sort of um, sulfur and nickel combo um, in that sort of typical sort of, more sort of silicate magnesium iron silica background. But little peaks of chrome, so showing up as pink. So that little splodge there is a little chromite and bits of calcium. So showing up there, that's probably an appetite, I think, here. You can see it's actually quite fine grained. You can get into my leg if you want. Yeah. Let's stop that going. And we'll zoom in a little bit more and get another picture for you. Yeah. So again, because we've zoomed in high and that's just refocusing the microscope to make sure we get a nice clear image. Nothing worse than using a very expensive bit machinery and then taking blurry photos. Cool. 
So when it comes to collecting data on microscopes, it's important to do both point and IDs, so this sort of single point spectra, um, as well as um, sort of mapping things. Um, that white edge on the spotting thing, um, in this case it is just a crack. Um, these things are kind of held together basically by mud, um, so that you often find quite nice edges around sort of clouded beaches. And let's put a couple of points in some of this white stuff. Oh yeah, that's fine. Dang it. That's a little bit more sensible. Um, so again, we've got this sort of nice nickel sulfur iron thing. Um, so this is Pentlandite again. Mm -hmm. This is this So spectrum eight is up here. So that looks like it's the same sort of compositions as everything else. There's a little bit of variation between them, but they're basically all the same mineral. And spectrum 9 is this sort of middle grey thing there. Uh, not appetite at all. What's made out of? Oh, it's it's chrome. Yeah, it's chrome right around the yeah. outside, right? Because <laughs> yeah. scale. Um, nice. So long point ID and doing mapping, we can also get a spectra over an area. So this really, really sort of fine grain stuff in the background, I'm just going to put a little box over it and it will create a spectra for that area. Um, and give us sort of more like an average composition. I see like it's roughly magnesium, silica, iron, and a little bit of sulfur. So that's your standard sort of tequilonite, um, sort of phyllosilica background uh, that we find everywhere in Winchcom, actually. Do you have a favourite bit of Winchcom? Um, I think we did my bit. I just like, ah. I like metal. <laughs> yeah. Just plus it's very circular. And it, it's very, it is satisfying. It's very watch. satisfying. Yeah. I've not looked at it anywhere near as much as you guys have. I've watched it far too much. I'll be like, <laughs> well, with that in mind, why don't we share the large area of Colin? Yes. Oh. And people can help direct from that one. So we've been showing you so far, oops, let's zoom out, uh, this little um, backscatter image of the whole sample. What I prepared earlier is a coldness version. Um, so this is what happens when we start combining different element maps. So this is iron, magnesium, silica in red, green, blue. So iron is red, magnesium is green, and silica is blue. So you can see that nice olive beam at the top, some nice proper zoning up there that you can see all nice and colourfully. We've also got a couple of other features. We've got some bright green splodges, we've got some bright red splodges, we've got some blue bits. In this colour scheme, those black holes in it, these are made out of calcium. Um, I only combined three images and I didn't put calcium in this, unfortunately. Um, so these black holes in the middle there, these are all calcite. And for any particular features on this guide you'd like to have a look at? If not, I will share with you my favourite thing at Winchcombe. <laughs> Give you a moment to decide. You can see a lot more easily the mm. difference. Yeah, if we zoom in a little bit actually, like this line through here becomes yeah. quite apparent. Um, so this is the main lithology um, that we've got, but we do have like a nice little bit through here, which is very, very different in terms of texture. Um, it's also a bit different in composition. Um, and when we get into sort of looking at um, the accessory phases, so things that are not silicate minerals, so things like iron and sulfides, there's a definite change in this lithology to this lithology, which is quite cool. We weren't expecting to see that, and it's a nice little discovery for us. We also um, find a lot more metal as native mm. metal in the smaller lithology in our sample yeah. than we do in the majority of it. This is where we started, that big um, splodge of metal down at the bottom there. Um, so you can see there's actually much less individual chunks of red um, in this big lithology at the top, whereas most of it is down here in that little piece. But could we go have a look at my favourite little round thing, please? And <laughs> uh, shouldn't we? No. So we're going to have a look at my favourite bit of Winchcombe, which was. Uh, yep. So I work on igneous meteorites normally, so seeing anything that's round in those is very alarming. So I've had a nice time looking at Winchcombe and seeing things that are actually round. Um, so again, that's just refocusing, so we've moved across the sample and it may not be completely flat, and we don't want to get blurry images. 
maybe in the first night. Okay, I'm gonna get into it. Oh, that's quite nice. But this is my favourite piece of Winchcombe, which looks very boring up top. But then we start seeing this funky little round thing. Um, so this took about two weeks of my life trying to work out what it was. <laughs> it was a lot of minerals I've not come across before in an SEM. Um, but this one I personally really enjoy. So I'm going to set a map running because it makes quite nice pictures and we will I'll tell you a little bit about it, I guess. Turn oxygen off because oxygen's and everything. Um, oh, that's going to be a very unfortunate colour scheme. Ah. Let's turn off silica <laughs> see what that does. Um, but this is a what we would call a refractory inclusion. So it's one of the earliest solids that forms. And you see it's actually got quite a funky little texture. So it's not just one mineral, there's lots of different minerals in there. You see through all those different shades of grey. In this case, it's really rich in aluminium. It's also really rich in magnesium. So everything that's showing up as purple in the middle there, that's a mineral called spinel. Um, and on top of that, we've got, what's the color of calcium? Let's shove calcium in red. We've also got these sort of like flamingo orange splodges as well. Um, this is a mineral called porovskite. Um, so this is, we've been referring to it as the spinel porovskite dioxide ferrule. Um, that, that's just a is, mouthful. Yeah, it's my favourite round thing. <laughs> yeah. It's fun or fun. This is a carbonaceous chondrite thing that I am not familiar with. I can't remember what FUN stands for. <laughs> I will fully admit that. Um, so, Mike, if you could explain what FUN is for me, um, that would actually be great. And I will tell you if it is fun or fun. It's definitely the latter. It is definitely fun. I really yeah. enjoy it. Um, so we've got this rim around the outside. This is a, a high... Oh, yeah, isn't it? It's a high iron pyroxene, um, so that's called biopside. Will that inclusion by chance be blue in normal reflected light? We haven't checked. We haven't done reflected light. We haven't. There are other teams doing reflected light, yep. so we don't need um, to. Yep, so we're firmly just the electron microscopy team. Um, we've got everyone who's working in Winchcombe is separated off into areas of expertise. So we're just doing um, electron microscopy on the coarse grain silicates. So anything that is sort of an actual crystal, and we're less worried about the sort of muddy stuff in the background. We're helping out where we can, but our main goals is electron microscopy, imaging, and compositional data of the big chunky things. We'll also be doing some electron fat scatter diffraction, mm -hmm. which is another technique you can do in the electron microscope, which allows you to not, not just look at composition, but to look at the structure of the material. So where you have something that's pristine and it's grown into its normal crystal form, you can see it, but where it's been uh, affected by some kind of thermal metamorphism or aqueous alteration or even deformation due to impacts and so on, you can see the deformation being recorded in that natural crystal structure and we can measure that deformation through time, which is really, really cool. Mm. So that's one of the things that this team are going to be specialising in within the UK science team. Mm. Lots to do, really. We're all very busy with it. It's, it's just really exciting and it's nice to be involved. <laughs> Um, so we've got this little splodge of chlorine up here, if I turn that on. So that little cube. Yes, this little cube up here. That is a very small chunk of chloroacetite, so it matches up with the calcium peak as well, and sodium bit. So that's just a tiny, tiny little cube of acetite. Um, but in here we've got, well, got dioxide in that sort of like ugly sort of grungy colour that I've made. <laughs> um, what if I make iron more green? Maybe that will fix yeah. it. Oh, it could be nice and dark blue, you're right. Everything is not lilac. lilac. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so that sort of lilac edge there, that is your high iron pyroxene, that's dioxide. We've then got um, our spinel in that dark purple, and again, that pink colour is your perovskite. So this is my favourite part of Winchcombe. Um, I don't think there's anything else that makes a good map in Winchcombe. So one of the cool things about the perovskites in here is perovskites are one of the earliest things that formed in the solar system. So perovskites are a mineral called hibonite as well. And so being able to find those when you don't have CAIs, so this isn't like the CAIs, no, to the question that just came through from Murchison. 
So where you don't have those CAIs, which are some of the first solids to condense in the early solar system, you start to then move on to minerals as well. So perovskite, hibernite, and things like that, some of those earliest solids. So if we were to then take this and subsequently do some dating on it, we would expect the perovskites in here to be really rather old in comparison to that sort of altered wet mush around the outside that Jen's been talking about yeah. in the shilonite. It does remind me of pomegranate. I think this little splodge through here looks like a frog from above. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I see every time I look at it, but it is it's very pomegranate-esque. Um, what's another fun bit to look at? Get the map up and see if anybody... Paragamba. Has it gone? This guy. So we are here currently. Is it anything interesting anyone like to have a look at? Let us know. So we've been across the top, we've been up here in this splodge, we've had a look through here, we've been down at the bottom, and we've been here. Um, we've probably got time for like yeah, we got two more things. I think, got we, time. Yeah. If there's anything in particular anyone would like to look at, let us know, and if not, we'll do something. The bright green spot in the middle, absolutely. That's uh, the other spinel. Yeah. Oh, we're just trying to match up the microscope um, to our picture. I've seen that for me. It is. Yeah, should be around that sort of area. Uh, yeah. So keep going. Upward. Oh no. Nope. It's not. A, so that fracture that's too high, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry, we're just matching stuff up. <laughs> Bear with us. Are you using the back scatter? Oh. Um, Yep, let me find yeah. it's this sort of dark bit there. That one here, where I was. Where I was. This. Uh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Found it. There you go, panic over everyone. <laughs> Playing a game of hide and seek yep. in a rock. So we will okay. So this is that bright green splodge that we saw. Um on that colourful image is this round little doodad in the middle. So again, we've got that sort of druzy to kilonite stuff, that kind of feathery texture on the edge. Um, that's your alteration products. But we're interested in this chap in the middle. Um, so I will actually just do a spectra because this one doesn't make the prettiest maps. But it's made out of very little. <laughs> it's made out of oxygen, aluminium, and magnesium predominantly. So this is another spinel. Um, so the spinel we looked at previously, it's the same composition as this stuff. Um, however, this one is just spinel, there isn't anything else really in it. But it's quite nice, it was a nice little find for us. And again, it took me a long time to work out what it is because mm -hmm. I work on pyroxene almost exclusively. And it does indeed look a little bit like a walnut. Yeah. Um, it's quite a nice little chunk. Um, there is no. So this sort of rim around the edge that you can kind of see, um, that seems to be a pretty common thing in our piece of Winchcombe. Um, we have like these more solid materials that have been kind of like embedded in like the sort of mud and the clays effectively, and you get these nice sort of rims that form around stuff. We've got this really nice sort of like druzy night as well around the edge. Nobody else has got anywhere to go. Cheska's in the audience. And Cheska, Cheska where do you want to look at this sample? So. so Cheska is working with us as a technician at the moment. We've got her for a couple of weeks. Um, so she did her research masters with us, and we're just holding on to her now. Um, but she <laughs> just had to stay for as long as possible. <laughs> so where do you want to look at, Cheska? Um, I really enjoy the little spinel down at the, the circular one that you've already been to uh, but what about 
on the left hand side the kind of mess of a oh, oh yes <laughs> yes because this is where our funky little zone chromites are yeah chromites yes. um yep, so we're now going to zoom in on this sort of splodgy looking area i think we're the only team that's got these as well don't we? yes yeah, we'll do it. We'll do a dramatic zoom in. So you can see in the back scatter, there's kind of just a lot happening. Um, lots of different shades of grey, lots of different textures going on. Um, so we've got the sort of fuzzier stuff, we've got these sort of like flat areas and these sort of speckly bits. Lots of different types of everything, really. Yeah, there's a lot going on. <laughs> so whilst you talk through that, what yes. area do you want me to zoom in on? Um, for my two bits up here. Yeah, I think so. In my centre. Um, I don't mind too much actually. It's all kind of much I'll, the same. I'll see what I can find whilst yeah. you talk that through. Um, so this is an area of alteration. Um, so probably aqueous alteration. Um, that's around the edge of the sample. We can't actually work out which topology this one belongs to yet because it all gets a little bit messy. Um, but what we have is the sort of phyllosilicate and tequilonite sort of background, that dark grey. So like this lighter patch through here, that's a big chunk of tequilonite. Um, and it's showing up as lighter because tequilonite includes sulfur in its crystal structure, so it's a little bit heavier. We've got these big sort of like fuzzy patches through here. These are all different types of sulfide. Um, they're typically iron sulfides. Um, so things like troilite and pyrotite. Um, I can't remember if it all sound pyrite in it yet. Um, we've got lots of like a lot going on. Um, so often when you start altering rocks, you get all sorts of breakdown products. You get all sorts of other new minerals forming, um, and the, what you would normally expect to see stops looking how you would expect to see it. Um, so it can be quite a challenge sometimes dealing with um, dealing with really altered rocks. It's a fun challenge, I think. I enjoy it. A um, bit higher up, I think. They're next to a big splodge of sulfide. Let's see if I can find them on the back scatter. So I'm just trying to find something that I think is really cool, but trying to find it on three different images is <laughs> it's a stretch sometimes. Oh, no, I can miss it. It's another little area of alteration, so sort of like on that point, they look a bit like whales. Roaming sort of for like roughly sort of Snowdonia. Yeah, so it's in this sort of little squatch. Yeah. So we're zooming in now to like another little bit of area of alteration. So same sort of alteration as this, but this one's a smidge more exciting. Um, at least we think so. Because we are horribly, horribly biased. Um, so we'll just let that get it all in focus again. Do you want me to do that and then go in? Um, yeah, why not? Okay. So we'll see where we are now. So another area of alteration. We've got this big, um, I think it's an iron sulfide. I don't think it's pentlandite, but I'll put a point in. We'll double check. We see this area of alteration where all these sort of silicate minerals started to break down. We've got these little bits of metal everywhere. Um, we've also got these cubes, which are some of my favourite things. But my, I would say they're my second favourite part of which one. I'll go in and get a better yep. image. Yep, I agree. Go. I love the cubes so much. <laughs> so this white splodge up here is pentlandite, so you're good to go. And that's going to zoom in on the cubes. Because uh, it's a fun little feature that so far I think we're the only team that's found in their sample. So when we're looking at these meteorites, we're only looking at a polished surface. So when there's lots of variation within a meteorite or within any rock or any material, and you're only looking at one bit of it, there are going to be things that you miss. Um, we've only got a small piece, so we're probably not missing much. But even in our tiny little piece, you can see the amount of variation that there is within it. So being able to get a complete picture of everything ever that is in this rock can actually be quite difficult. Um, whereas what we can do is come up with like representative ideas of what is there. So that's one loaded. So we zoomed in. So we're now zooming into this section down here. And we've got these funky little cubes. Um, 
Which, let's do a map over these guys, because they're nice. Yeah, so that was one run through. Uh, so this is a new mineral. Plus, we've kind of touched on it briefly for being um, in today fashion. I'll see if I make sure we get a nice colour scheme out of it at the very least. Maybe we should paint it. Calcium and orange? Ooh. Maybe calcium should not be an orange, but never mind, we're committing to it now. <laughs> I think iron green, because iron always has to be green in our yellow schemes. It feels wrong if it's not. <laughs> so as these different um, colours start loading in, we've actually got um, these sort of nice shaped things. Are they cubic cubes? Or the way they've been sliced through. These are most likely cubic cubes. Um, yeah, actually, a cubic mineral habit, yeah. so they grow naturally in a cubic form, and then they've been incorporated into the, the mess that surrounds them. Yeah. Um, so this is a fun alteration product, we think. Um, hasn't been very much work done on these little minerals, um, which is quite exciting for us. <laughs> um, why is sodium popping up? Let's turn sodium off. Where's it gone? I mean, vanadium probably is there, but it's not the most exciting map. And we'll turn aluminium on, and let's make aluminium purple. So we're probably going to sort of leave it kind of here-ish. So this is a very, very cool little thing. Um, as you can see from the colours down at the bottom there, we've got lots of chrome, lots of aluminium. So we've got these little cubes of chromite. Um, which is very exciting for us because these likely form exactly here as a late stage thing. Um, so we're going to let this one finish through. If you've got any last questions for us, let us know. Um, and then whilst you're typing out your questions, in the meantime, we would like to proudly announce the start of our microscopy live quiz. <laughs> um, so I will stop sharing so you can see us. Oh, God, where are we? Sorry. There we go. That's us. So um, now that Joel are supporting us, um, with this, and we want to make Microscopy Live sort of more interactive and more fun. Um, when you get your summary booklets of today's session, uh, which will be later today, um, we're also going to attach a quiz to it, and you've got the chance to win some of not only our branded goodies, but also Joel branded goodies. So we've got um, one of our PMC tote bags, we've got a Joel water bottle, we've got other stuff inside, we've got Still branded hand sanitizer. That it's good smells, hand sanitizer. Smells really good. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's really recommend. <laughs> We've got two of our pencils. We've got a uh, lens cloth that Lorelei made. And so this is one of Lorelei's images. It's a nice little geological one. It's also a meteorite. Yeah, it is also a meteorite. We've got a Joel lens cloth. This is the Rocky Marge uh, lens cloth, which is from their Neoscope launch, which as of next week will be introducing you to our Neoscope. Which is very exciting. Very exciting. Yes. Uh, it's a very powerful little machine, and we're very excited to introduce that to everyone. And we've also got one of our notebooks for you. Um, so, all it is, it'll be a multiple choice question, um, which I will come up with later. Um, and then we will announce the winner. It'll be randomly selected. Uh, in the meantime, we'll announce that at the next session. So, make sure you come back. Yeah. Next time, we are doing, we're doing art. art stuff. So, we're having a look at some of the art supplies that you can find and mm -hmm. just showing interesting stuff about some of the little things. We used to make very creative things. Yeah. So we're matching up with British Art Week, I think, just about. Sci British Science Week. British Science Week, that's yeah. the one. Um, so we'll have things like paint, we'll have paintbrushes, we'll have gold leaf, we'll have silver leaf. Um, some chalk. Yeah, and some chalk, see if we can find fossils and chalk. I don't yeah. know, we might Who be able knows? to. We'll see. We'll see. Um, if you've got any final questions, let us know. If not, um, thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you for supporting us, and we're very pleased to be able to introduce our little piece of space to you. Anyone welcome everyone. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes.